like I said, this is really special for me because uh, we would not be here today, I think. I mean, I know we would not be here today uh, doing this, um, but for um, one of our guests, Ben Campus, who was um, D Word host, uh, along with he and I were the D Word hosts for from I think year two through maybe I don't know for about ten years I think we were the sole co-hosts and then John came in and Marge and 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 um, Erica and so on but uh, Ben was like just instrumental in our um, in our development as an online community and just put in gobs and gobs and gobs of time and is like the unsung hero of um, of the D word. So um, I just wanted to express my gratitude and, and appreciation for all that he, he did all those years. Um, and then he went off to do film and campaign. I don't understand because being a D word host is so lucrative, um, but um, anyway, Ben and Rachel, uh, we welcome you. And um, we called the session Transforming Theatrical um, in a, you know, for documentaries. Um, and so I wanna you know, use that to set the context of our discussion today. Um, so Ben, Rachel, uh, you know, tell us what is it about theatrical that needs transforming? What is, what's the crisis in theatrical? Um, that you feel needs to be filled? Well, hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, th that appreciation that you mentioned is mutual. Um, and, you know, of course, I, I wouldn't be here doing what I'm doing if it hadn't been for the D word. And it's, it's so lovely to see so many familiar faces and names here on the, on the screen and in the participants list, um, you know, Erica, Jeffrey, Julia, you know, I, I don't know where to, where to start. Anyway, um, but uh, I don't mean to, to distract too much. Um, the, the, the kind of slightly provocative title um, for, for the session came from the release of a film called The Oil Machine that coincided basically with this. This was a, a Screen Daily uh, article uh, that came out around about the same time as we were to launch this in the cinema. Um, by the way, I'm not doing the kind of Zoom screen sharing all the time back and forth. Uh, I just kind of switch to things occasionally. So if you want to see this in full screen mode, you would need to pin our, um, our video. I also apologize, it says Ben Kempas and Rachel Kaplan, he, him. We tried to find the he, him in the Zoom settings, but we were only able to adjust the names. So don't be confused by that. Um, it's she, her. <laughs> and um, What else? Um, yeah, the, um, the is the theatrical market in crisis for feature documentaries, uh, Screen Daily asked there. Distributors and sales agents have given a stark assessment of what some are describing a crisis facing feature documentaries at the global box office. So what does that mean? Um, I, in, par in particular, uh, the, demo the, the sort of demographic that used to go to the cinema to watch documentary films um, has not been returning to the cinemas after the, the pandemic. These tend to be, you know, slightly older demographic and, you know, everybody's making their choices where they want to go back to in, in life and cinema for these audiences just wasn't happening. And there was a, also a particular uh, tragic story here in Edinburgh. Maybe you want to talk about that. So we were a couple of weeks out from launching our campaign for the oil machine, which included a national um, tour of panels and speakers all over the UK and a couple of weeks out we woke up to the news that our beloved Edinburgh film house was closing or had closed with immediate effect without any warning. Um, some people will have seen this, it was part of a cinema group that included Edinburgh International Film Festival, the Film House Cinema and the Belmont Cinema in Aberdeen, iconic um, uh, temples for showing independent 
films and definitely part of the cultural DNA of all of us here in Scotland. Um, and it, this also posed an immediate challenge for the film because we had screenings planned with panels at these at these venues. But it really um, hit home very hard that cinemas are um, facing this moment of reckoning right now coming out of the pandemic. And we're sure that um, other cinemas in the UK and, and Europe and globally will follow in the next year. Uh, so what did this mean when we're about to try and launch uh, an a heavy hitting environmental documentary in screens all across the UK? Cinemas are closing. We know from the trades that audiences are not going out to see documentary films. And then what happened? Ben, <laughs> what well, should we go from there? Yeah. So doom we, and gloom. <laughs> um, we we you know yeah. this was from the beginning planned as an as an impact campaign mm -hmm. to supplement the uh, theatrical release. Um, the film is about North Sea oil and it, how it has uh, shaped the UK in particular um, since its discovery in in 1970. And, you know, all the problems that come with fossil fuels, but also how, you know, intrinsically in, in, interwoven, can you say that, in, in society it is, um, and, you know, what to do about it. Uh, maybe it'll, it'll give you a good idea if I just quickly uh, play the, the trailer. Sure. This is made of oil. 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 It can feel like you're up against something that's so massive, that's got the support of governments and people who are so much more powerful than you. We say between 10 to 20 million barrels of oil are still out there for us to get after. It represents a massive opportunity for us. If all of that was found and combusted, that is a huge amount of carbon dioxide just from, remember, the North Sea, the UK North Sea. I feel like I got to a point where I was so desperate about what should I do, what can I do? I'm taking the UK government to court to pull the plug on public payments for big polluters. We have an addiction to oil and gas in our society. Effectively, we're living inside an oil machine. It became an, an engine driving forward the UK financial sector. This is made of oil. This is made of oil. Which means that people's pensions, savings and investments in the UK are actually invested in financing a future that no one wants to see, that no one really realises what career am I going to have based off of this and where am I going to live and what food am I going to be able to eat? I believe that what we do over the next five years will determine the future of humanity for the next millennium. So, yeah. Um, a film by Emma Davy, who many of you will know, produced by Sonia Henrizzi, who many of you will know. And about at the end of 2021, December 2021, they came to us, uh, Rachel wasn't here at that time, um, to develop uh, ideas for an outreach campaign. And we came up with this campaign that's called After the Oil Machine. Uh, it's called After for three reasons. Um, one is to um, uh, is is that it's about what's happening after you've seen the film The Oil Machine. It's also about the big question: what comes as we are trying to get beyond oil? And it's I'm missing the third one now. Um, what was it? I'm going to look on our own website. <laughs> oh, right there. Oh yeah, what's been happening since <laughs> filming? So um, the um the, the the thing that happened was that um the the film was finished um in early 2022 it premiered at sheffield dog fest in june 2022 and so much was happening 
um, you know, since the film had completed production, you know, the war in Ukraine, an energy crisis, a cost of living crisis, UK governments basically came in and out of the door, you know, like a, like on a on a conveyor belt, and um, it was I was mad, and we at some point asked us, you know, is this film by the time we this gets released in the fall completely out of date? Uh, so a big part of the campaign design was to always place it in the current context and go back to all of our protagonists and do catch up interviews with them to you know talk about what's happened since the film was made and we hope that sort of you know that way the film would stay relevant and and i i hope uh, that that has worked at least sort of the the, the figures suggest ben, that, ben yeah. what did you do with the videos did you put them up on a website did you get them out through social media or through emails um take us through that process of keeping it alive it's it's basically uh, uh twitter that worked especially well for us and youtube uh facebook and instagram not so much uh, so we did longer catch up interviews, which we posted on YouTube. They are around 20 minutes each. Um, and then we did short clips from them uh, to um, uh, uh, place the, uh, to, 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 to use on, on, on Twitter, basically. Um, unfortunately, if you go to Twitter at the moment, something's wrong with video playback on Twitter for lots and lots of users, including us. So it's all a bit out of sync and stutters and so on. So many of you will have noticed that elsewhere. Uh, but I can c play just a quick uh, clip here. We don't need to watch the whole thing. Um, just to get an idea of the sort of format that we, we uh, produced. You talk about a mitigation denial. What does that mean? There's a, a new book out, The Climate Book by Greta Thunberg, and the, the, the section that I wrote in that focuses on this whole sort of concept of mitigation denial. And this is that we, we're all aware, aware of, of the, what we call climate denial. I mean, basically people who just, just don't like the repercussions of what the science says. And that has been driven, as I say, by the oil companies deliberately. They were fully aware of the um, impacts and dangers of climate change a long, long time ago, but they literally have lied year on year, decade on decade about these issues and continue to do so today. And it's easy to blame them. But actually, I think the expert community who have obviously accepted the science has not accepted that we have to do what we have to do about mitigation. We have denied the scale of the mitigation that is required, that the scale of the cuts and emissions that are required. You have to fundamentally reshape many aspects of modern society. In particular, you've got to really focus on where most of the emissions come from. And most of the emissions relate to the lifestyles of a relatively few people in the world. And who are that group? Well, in that group are the professors, the journalists, the climate experts, the policymakers, the entrepreneurs, the business leaders, all the people who have shaped the climate agenda um, and have shaped the models about what we need to do about climate change. All of that group are in the very high emitting sector. So this is actually, um, uh, you know, a, a, one of the videos that uh, went a little bit viral on Twitter, if I dare use that word. Um, the um, Ben, can you take the video off and put it back on on you? There you go. Yeah. Um, you. Well, I was still talking about the video. So um, the um, I don't have the exact figures, but it, it's been, you know, seen tens of thousands of times, uh, which of course then helped drive attention to the film. And it also made the film current again. So this professor that you heard there, um, you know, uh, is in the film, Kevin Anderson, a uh, climate scientist. Uh, but what he's talking about is sort of how the whole kind of climate community is, um, you know, jetting to, to Egypt, you know, uh, tens of thousands of people there. Uh, for the COP27 summit um, and thus not exactly setting the, the best example uh, of how we should change our, our behavior. So there was the current context, you know, COP27 was in November, so the theatrical release was also 
timed to coincide with that. Uh, the, the premiere was on the 3rd of November, which was just on the eve of, of the COP conference. And um, it's, you know, first we had difficulty booking cinemas. Um, Jed Fitzsimmons of, 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 of Cosmic Cat uh, has been great, uh, you know, pursuing them all. Um, first we were told, oh no, this is getting into award season and, you know, you, you and your little documentary, you know, you uh, are at, 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 the, at the back end of, of, of the queue. But then as soon as sort of people saw the whole effort that went into this, you know, into making this much more than just a film release, it, it, it picked up and, you know, uh, Picture House has entered a, a corporation. Picture House is a, uh, an art house cinema chain that belongs to um, uh, Cineworld. Um, again, under threat itself because Cineworld filed for bankruptcy protection in the United States. Uh, uh, also, just last last autumn, if I remember right, we didn't even know if picture houses would be around, yeah. but luckily they they were, and um, at, yeah, we can we can just generally report that sort of it it was a success whenever we turned screenings into events. So you've been organising a lot of uh, things around these screenings. Yeah, yeah. So a uh, vital component of the campaign was to. Um, provide speakers and panels and Q and A's at as many screenings as we could uh, in for the cinema release across the UK, and we uh, did um, have panels lined up at over half of uh, half of the screenings that took place in cinemas. Alongside that, doing outreach to communities to do free community screenings wherever they are. Um, and that was a wide range of groups, obviously a lot of climate action groups, but also um, local um, schools, universities, faith groups, um, development trusts, uh, just town halls. Um, so there've been, um, to date we've done over a hundred screenings uh, since we launched in November. And we, um, it continues to, every week there are um, more screenings than we can keep up with. Yeah, Ben's showing the map uh, here. If you scroll up, this, these are all the screenings we've had to date, community um, events. And we started to notice that um, we were having incredible turnout at events where there were speakers and panels involved. People really, really wanted to come together to see this film on a big screen and to learn from the experts that would be available for Q&A and to discuss the issues with each other uh, and often um, those discussions, the Q&As, you know, it's a, it's a feature length film, it's 82 minute film, sometimes the Q&As would still then run for easily 45 minutes, <laughs> an hour afterwards um, and um, and uh, yeah, what yeah. you see here, I'm scrolling Sorry. through the list yeah. is, is uh, you know, all the screenings and you see every time it, it has this bar after the oil machine, that means there was like an extra thing, um, you know, be it a panel discussion, a all Q and A, yeah. you know, it might be people from the film or it might be people that came together locally. Mm -hmm. And I'm just scrolling through here to, to show you the, look, there's one without, but kind of the, it, I think they've all had discussions, so yeah. maybe don't make it up there. Um, so um, the Q&As were definitely, people really wanted to talk about the issues and quite often then the, con the conversations would continue on into the cinema bar and whatnot afterwards. <coughs> um, and we were noticing that um, there was, when we started to see the numbers come back from um, the cinemas, there was a really distinct pattern. Um, the cinemas that had a Q and A um, were were um, very very well attended and even sold out a lot of the time or drawing really big crowds, and cinemas which didn't were virtually empty, uh, where the film was just playing in um, some locations without anything else attached. Uh, and overall, this is our report that Ben is scrolling through here. Yeah, they're not seeing our... it. Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. I'm, we've got all kinds of screens open. 
Um, this is what's going on. Sorry. Um, so we um, we definitely noticed uh, so many more people coming. In fact, when we started crunching the numbers, we were see seeing six times, on average, across all those hundred screenings, six times more people at the screenings that had some kind of discussion or panel afterwards. Now that's not news. We all know that um, you know eventizing a screening can help draw a crowd. I've been working in fil for film festivals a long time, for example, and everyone knows in the festival realm that if you have a screening with a, a special guest or a Q&A afterwards or, or, or uh, something social, a party, um, it's going to draw a crowd compared to a standalone simple showing of a film. Um, so this is not news, um, but it was really interesting for us to see that in a sort of theatrical cinema setting for this national cinema release. Um, and also that um, the impact that, uh, you know, we were fortunate to be able to do this campaign to have the resources, because it is very labor intensive, to be able to curate, carefully curate those panels and speakers. We had over a hundred speakers in a hundred days um, at these screenings um, all across the country. And you know, it's very resource intensive to do that. But because we were able to do that with our um, impact campaign funding, uh, it really, really made an incredible difference to what um, we were able let me, to do. Let me ask a little bit more about that. And by the way, folks, there, there's some really good questions in the chat, like Jimmy, yours, I noticed yours. Um, Hold on to them. I will. I promise you. In a in a short while, we'll have um, a Q and A, and just use the raised hand and and come on camera for them. Um, let's talk about the impact campaign for a sec, because that's a big part of what you do. And it seems like the success of the oil machine grew out of a tremendous impact campaign. So, for filmmakers who might want to work with you or work with some you know company in developing a uh, impact campaign. What are what are the first steps in that? I mean, how do you go about forming the impact campaign, and how much of it is driven by the filmmaker, and how much do you, you know, work hand in hand doing that? What, tell me, take us through the steps. Oh, I I, I wish there were steps. <laughs> um, it's uh, a different story with every project. You know that just like a different stories behind the development of every of your films. Um, the, 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 the campaign development, you know, works in a different way every time, depending on where people are in the in the whole journey. Ideally, uh, the development of campaign ideas should happen in parallel to the development of the film project itself. And what people keep telling me, filmmakers who take part in development workshops at such an early stage, is that, you know, thinking about audiences, thinking about what impact you want to have, you know, thinking about messaging and so on, um, really help them sharpen the focus in their own filmmaking. This is not to say that they go on to make a film that sort of hammers home a message and tells you what to think and this is good and this is bad. I think by now we all know that the films that have the much greater impact are not the ones that tell you what to think, but the ones that, you know, are nuanced, beautiful cinematic experiences, uh, human that are, you know, the, the, the sort of documentaries that we all, you know, uh, love and hopefully occasionally make. So um, that's that's the, the impact stuff. So when I say so sharpen the focus, um, that means just sort of having that at the back of your head, but not kind of making the film in a certain style. Unfortunately, most people only come to us, uh, you know, at a point in time when the film's already done, maybe they already had like a, a, a world premiere and now they're thinking about what else to do with it. Um, and that's always problematic because it takes a long time to build partnerships with organizations, especially in the nonprofit space. It takes a long time to raise funding and it takes also a long time to come up with some campaign ideas that are a bit out of the box. Because my, my ambition is that, you know, every campaign should be as unique as the film it's for and not do like a standard sort of 
out of the box approach where sort of you just go like oh yeah and we'll we'll tour a bit with the film and you know we'll have community events and uh, you know this and that um that you know they, they for, for me i always want to kind of have something in a campaign that um you know people will talk about you know because it's made them do something or because they've seen the film in an unusual way or because they heard about the whole thing in an unusual way and in and in, in that way you know the the online thing is a really big factor i think because that's the main avenue you know this additional content that we were producing you just saw one example but there there were tons more of that um you know has really helped drive attention to this to this film so um can, the, can i just jump in yeah. for a moment and say i think i should point out that although this is a film that's very to the the energy needs and the climate crisis it's not a traditional advocacy film it's not a film that has that kind of call for action or take action or some petition to sign or some appeal to do something. It really is a film that presents um, many different facets of the energy conversation and is there to springboard further conversations. Um, various solutions are put forward by contributors in the film, but the film itself isn't um, campaigning. So I think that was um, another really interesting thing um, when thinking about how to um, launch the film and um, develop the impact campaign as well um, because it, it, there were just more opportunities to, as you were saying Ben, to actually think creatively and outside the box a little bit. Yeah, Yeah. so the, the one of the big strengths of this particular project is that um, the uh, uh, we have, as you've seen in the trailer, people, for example, from the oil industry in the film. So we produced additional materials around their views as well, and you know how they've um, uh, how they kind of try to justify what they do. Uh, there's no <laughs> other word for it. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, and when it came to action as part of the campaign, we didn't officially tell people, you know, what to do. But we went to all our um, key uh, people from the film and asked them, you know, how should people make a difference? So that way, you know, the, the responsible investor here, you know, would say, OK, make sure your pension isn't invested in, in, um, in uh, fossil fuels. Uh, then, you know, uh, demand from others that they divest, you know, drill, drill deeper into the oil machine. Uh, you know, get get politicians involved, um, support a just transition uh, you know, for the for the oil workers, meaning they get work in the in the renewables in industry, etc. Um, uh, start conversations where wherever you are, you know, make informed choices yourself. Get involved in your community. So, you know, in the end, things like you know, the just stop oil, which is a big movement here in the UK. Um, you know, we were linking to them, but we were linking to them as, look, the activists in this film say you should check out, you know, Just Stop Oil or Stop Rosebank or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we never sort of threw our own weight fully behind something. And we didn't have like a single big partner organization for this campaign, as is often the case uh, to have one, um, and had this sort of, multilateral sort of you know um uh, there's a german word gießkan uh, uh methode which means the uh, watering can approach <laughs> you, know, you you sprinkle a little bit everywhere um that that was the the strategy here and in a sense that's that's worked for us because we were not exactly neutral but kind of you know something different for people to to engage with but I don't know if I talked enough about the sort of general steps that you were asking initially there. I'll get, um, I'll, I'll get back to it, but the, the, a question sort of comes into my head from what you're, you're saying about how the oil machine got butts in the seats in theaters. Um, it sort of begs the question, what if, you know, filmmakers who don't have a, a film driven by a social issue or issues, um, but it's more like a character-based story or, um, you know, just um, 
what, you know, what would you advise them in terms of, you know, they don't have the outreach campaign. Um, how do they create events that get people into the theater during these times when people aren't eager to go out to theaters? You said yourself without speakers, nobody was coming to your, to your showings. Yeah, um, well, it's, it's, it, it's still by, by kind of being original with, with what you do, um, you know, having a unique idea. And I think you need to distinguish here between two things, between outreach and impact, which are often used synonymously. <laughs> but in fact, sort of, you know, a lot more people can do outreach, which is basically meaning going that extra mile to reach the people who should see your film rather than relying on the more traditional or established uh, ways of distribution. And the other um, is to, um, the, the other is impact, which is about, you know, uh, creating awareness for something, changing uh, attitudes of people, changing behaviors, uh, changing the structures that surround us or, you know, building community. Um, and not every film can fulfill, you know, any or all of these impact crit criteria, but I think outreach you can pretty much do with any documentary. You know, if you if you think of the project you're, you're working on, Doug, you know, kind of, which is based on a note found by a book, you know, I think um, you, you've been engaging people in the search for the identities of, um, uh, what are they called again? Henri and... Um, Henri and Henri, yes. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, that in a sense is sort of an outreach thing that you could sort of spin on, you know, you could, you could go and, you know, have other people, you know, see what they find in their books or, you know, have a thing where kind of messages get, get, get sent to around, you know, it's, it's like that there's something playful in there, you know, it, it would typically now take like a couple of hours of campaign workshop to kind of come up with something, you know, you could do around this, these sort of random finds, you know, like, for example, can we leave random finds in books, like in a, in a bookstore, for example, for people to find, and then that way in, in their books, and then that way they discover the film about this random find, you know, yeah. you can, you can be super creative with these kind of things. And that for that, you, your film doesn't need to be one that, uh, you know, changes the world. Right. But it, it, it sort of also begs, w w at what point do you do that? You know, if you're in the middle of filming, is that too early to start doing a playful campaign like that or build an Instagram campaign around, you know, what you're doing when you might not be done for a year or two? That, again, that's a different decision in every case, you know, because mm -hmm. often with documentaries, obviously, you need to protect protagonists or, you know, some investigation or, you know, whatever it is, or it's too personal or um, so sometimes you start with campaigning activities while production is still going on, uh, but you don't actually go live until after the film's finished. But let's stay with, with the example of, of, of your uh, ongoing project, you know. I, I presume that you make the, the search, you know, part of the, the story of the film, you know. So if there were any kind of wider outreach activities at this point already, you know, that can only help, right? I'd like to think. Um, anyway, enough about me. Let's get back to um, your, your filming campaign. And also, I'm totally, you know, again, take us through some steps, but I'm really intrigued. Um, by your use of this uh, thing called Nation Builder, that it was originally uh, for political campaigns, the software for political campaigns that you adapted to film campaigns. Can you tell us a bit about, um, you know, how that works in terms of, you know, creating a database and management and all that? Yeah, I mean, Nation Builder um, in itself is a software as a service, uh, you know, from a company in, in LA that's been used in the campaigning world in politics and by NGOs, you know, by anybody who wants to become a leader in this or that. And um, 
I first discovered it through the independence movement in Scotland. I was using it back in 2011 and then, you know, started uh, using it for films while I was at the Scottish Documentary Institute uh, prior to uh, starting film and campaign. And um, to this day, it's like a really useful tool in the sense that you have sort of so many outreach engagement tools in one box, you know, um, and you, you, you take control of your own data. So anytime, you know, you do a survey or you do a petition or so, you don't go to some third party site to, you know, um, like change.org, you know, it's a commercial organization, despite its name. Um, you know, you, you, you need to kind of pay them if you want to reach the people again that your petition uh, brought together. So it's these kind of things that um, uh, what, are why kind of you know taking ownership of your your data really makes sense and um, uh, the um, I'm losing my train of thought but you were using nation builder already yeah, at the I San Francisco Green Film Festival I show this, but I don't think it's that the the, the um, thing yes we were we were using so actually I'd connected with Ben because I was living and working in San Francisco for about the last 20 years and um, nice to see a few familiar faces today here uh, and we'd want we were very intrigued by this campaigning software because um, I was running an environmental film festival and we always said it's more than movies it's a movement so how do you build uh, you know start to um, approach a, a festival in a slightly different way um, and had connected with Ben because he was recommended to me by um, another filmmaker we'd been working with um, and he helped us build our website at that time, probably about 10 years ago. Um, and I'm, that was a large part of why we were able to grow our festival so quickly. Um, so it's a really, really powerful bit of software for um, you can um, track all your emails and conversations with different people. You can build connections between them. You can get people on paths. So, um, you know, receiving literally hundreds and hundreds of um, requests for uh, screenings at the moment you can keep track of everyone and where they are and who needs follow-up and who's got what and it just it just it's just a very very um you know it, it's a way to bring some sa sanity to your um to your <laughs> can, can you explain in us in a, in a little bit more detail how how do you get data from an email organized in such a way that you can i mean do you have to literally input the data into you're sending emails there's a cc address for the database and you just copy that by default into every email and it automatically puts it into the record for that person or for that company so when you open up their record you've got all the correspondence and everything tracked um so yeah so in essence yeah. um I, I i had this up a, a second ago uh um, this is this is from our own website here um it's content management so you know your your film's website or um, your company website or anything else can multiple websites can run on the same database you own your supporter database uh, which you know is basically your audience relations system and maybe also your industry contacts uh, it has the campaigning tools that i already mentioned um, it integrates with, with email and, and social media and in the US even texting. Uh, it uh, enables you to do run your event management um, as, you, as you saw on our website. Uh, so each of these events have a kind of front end on the website and the back end. And you know you can also run financial stuff through it like donation drives, fundraising, uh, 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 crowdfunding. Um, uh, invoices for screening fees, these kind of things. So in essence, it does nothing that, you know, kind of another bit of software would be doing as well. It's not revolutionary in that sense, but it is completely integrated. So at the back end, you know, you can see sort of, you know, on the, on the back end of the donation page who donated, then you click on that person, then you see what other interactions they did with you, you know, if maybe somebody from the team emailed them, etc. Uh, the, um, the, it, it, in, in essence, this is like putting your WordPress and your MailChimp and your PayPal and your, um, 
uh, Kickstarter, right, and, and and all these kind of things. You serve a monkey um, into one box. A nation builder isn't necessarily better than any of these kind of more specialist tools, but the beauty is the integration. And never at any point do you find yourself, you know, um, exporting CSV files uh, of contacts that you got through one thing into another thing and then constantly updating it and these kind of things. That's the beauty of it, that you have like uh, one single life system that you use all the time. It so, sounds almost too good to be true, Ben. So how, um, how much work does it, is it, well, first of all, how available is, is it available to anyone? Um, it's just a software that anyone can buy. Is it hugely expensive? Uh, no, I think it starts from around $30 a month, um, but mm -hmm. it can go up quite a bit if you have- um, Oh, 34 a month, according to Julie. Hmm? 34 a month, according to Julie, yeah. Yeah, but, uh, but, 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 but here's the thing. We are now something that's called the Nation Builder Alliance Partner. So we have our own little kind of headquarter nation and we can get you people, um, your nations cheaper. <laughs> so, um, sorry, it's a bit of uh, marketing here, but um, our clients can, you know, access or we can kind of custom make a nation builder plan for you that will hopefully come out cheaper what you would pay out of the box on the website. Um, hopefully then that we would hope that also means you let us build your, your, your film's website, for example, mm -hmm. or let us train you or, you know, one of these kind of things, uh, cause it is quite a complex system, you know, um, it, it, it does require quite a bit of, uh, time and, and, and uh, knowledge to, to, to operate it effectively. That's exactly what I was about to ask. I mean, you know, it sounds like, you know, to get it up and running and integrating with your film data, you know, just would take a lot of work. So, um, so you're saying you, you would be able to do that and, 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 and still be beat the price per month of the, of Nation Builder. So, well, that I mean, obviously, the the the, the 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 web design or so would be extra costs. You know that that's our interest. Sort of, you know, that's right. that's where we then earn something. We don't, but we don't earn from sort of sharing our allocation uh, of, of 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 nation builder capacity with you. There, we can be more flexible depending on you know how many people you need and and these kind of things. Do you ever help filmmakers raise the money for their campaigns? Or do they have to come with the with the funding in place to to do? Um, we are not like investors or, or funders ourselves. No, I know. Uh, for every, every yeah, it's important to say because occasionally you get people who kind of expect us to like invest in their impact campaign or so. Uh, it's it's always like providing a service, but part of that service can be to you know go and raise funds from. Um, uh, uh, other um, organizations and, and, and foundations and so on, like we did for, for um, the All Machines. So those funding applications that went out there, some of them um, not successful, some of them successful, uh, we wrote all of them. Right. At this point, you've identified certain funders for certain kinds of films, I imagine, that you can go back to. Yeah, I think the stuff that we've been working on is too diverse in in a sense, you know, but we're, we're for example, we had a really big campaign in, in Germany uh, in 2019 uh, with a single night of action. You can read about it on our website. It's called Die Kinder der Utopie, which translates as Children of Utopia, but um, it, it wasn't released in, in, in English language at all. Um, you know, big thing, 20,000 people turned out on a single night, which is huge for Germany for a documentary. It was like top three and um, in the cinema charts out of 200 films that day. I was, I was beautiful. And that was in large part because it was supported by Aktion Mensch, which is one of Germany's uh, largest uh, organization dealing with the needs of people with disabilities. And um, we're now kind of going back to them with a new project, a completely different film made by different people. 
uh, on the basis of that success. But that's probably the first time that we, uh, this, uh, yeah, the first time that we're actually going back to the same organization in the hopes of getting funding for another project. Um, you know, the, the, typically the sort of stuff that we've been working on is, is very diverse. Uh, it, you know, you get impact producers who very much specialize in one subject, you know, but um, I, over the years I've worked on films about rare diseases, uh, like, you know, I'm breathing on edible insects, the film's called Bugs, uh, on um, alternative financial models, films called Future My Love, on, um, you know, <laughs> the climate now. Um, and I never was an expert in any of these areas before doing that work, uh, which to an extent is, is quite helpful actually, because you approach these projects more with sort of the eyes of, of, of your ordinary audience member, if such a thing exists. Uh, but kind of, you know, you're, as a non-expert, maybe I'm asking more of the right questions to, to understand or to, you know, bring in a perspective from someone that isn't yet an expert in the subject matter. And mm -hmm. often at the point when, when I come in, you know, filmmakers are already experts themselves. Um, make sense? Yes, total sense. I, I have more questions if need be, but I promised we'd give plenty of time for questions from people here today. Um, so, um, Sean, Jane, Jimmy, I noticed you had questions in the chat. If you'd like to come on camera and ask them, this would be the time. And anybody else who wants to ask a question, um, far better if you use the raised hand function. Um, which I believe is on the bottom under reactions. If you hit the reactions icon, um, and we will call on you. Uh, so, Ethan, I'm just going to go whoever Sean, is. Sean is. I just put Sean up. Okay, very good. Oh God, <laughs> am I on? Okay, Sean. Yeah, go ahead. Am I on here? I wasn't planning on going live. Uh, well, I mean, just sort of getting into the starting point. I guess uh, when you're uh, you know, uh, trying to get a theatrical rolling. Did you uh, have a marketing plan? Uh, can you share that? I just did the big theatrical awards campaign um, in the fall with Eternal Spring. I'm happy to share some of those materials. Um, but I would also like to know what you started out with in terms of a marketing plan, uh, when that was developed and what your initial uh, marketing slash distribution impact budget was. Are you asking concretely about the, the oil machine? Yeah, specifically, uh, you know, it, yeah, what does the, a budget look like to do to do all of this? Yeah, an operating the, budget. The uh, this this one is around seventy five thousand um, uh, seventy five thousand dollars. Yeah, so uh, U.S. Uh, dollars, Ben. U.S. dollars. Yeah, and um, we're we're now in the process you know, we've, we've sort of burned through that rather quickly and we're now in the process of uh, hopefully raising, you know, another uh, 75,000 or something. Um, if I could have a follow up, where did that financing come from? I, I, I at this point, this is uh, in such a, you know, delicate stage that I wouldn't uh, want to comment on that. Oh, okay. Um, and, 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 and so did you have a plan? Like, did you formulate a plan, like a written marketing plan? Yeah. I mean, it's a different story with, with every project, you know, sometimes it's just an application to the funder that then basically constitutes the plan. Sometimes you make a sort of big shiny PDF, um, you know, that explains everything we want to do. Um, you know, sometimes it's the results of a of a of a development workshop that uh, get get written up basically, and in, in a in, into a campaign strategy. Great, thanks, John. Does that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, we like you yes. know we we've just sort of done an, like an interim report for for the oil machine, which as you can see here on my screen is in a in a sort of Google Doc format uh, still, so it's not big and shiny and and everything. It's just uh, a, like an interim thing that we did, but uh, we will produce a more 
kind of public facing uh, version of this. This was just what was going back to one of the funders um, where you kind of talk about all the objectives that you set out to do and how you delivered against them and, and so on. There's, uh, there's, there's plenty of other examples of, of that sort of thing out there of these kind of impact reports. Uh, I just looked at the one from uh, Meet the Future who were also clients of ours, but only for the kind of live stream production that we also do that I'd love to sort of talk about for a second at some point as well, if you, if you have time for that. But um, uh, if you look on the Meet the Future website, that, that's a very impressive impact report as an example. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Um, Jane, you cannot uh, find your, your hand raise function, so I'll call on you now. Come up on camera. Mute my bit. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you, guys. It's really, really fascinating and interesting. I'm doing a project that is really, really international, and it's based on having um, experts at involved in the screenings, even if they're on television. Um, we even when we do events, we have we have uh, panels afterwards. And but I was looking at your map when you showed the oil thing and it was concentrated in the UK and then a few little bits in what I could see in Europe. And so I wonder, have you done anything that can encompasses really the whole goddamn world? Because it's a big job. <laughs> um, have I done anything with this film or like more generally speaking? More generally speaking with other projects. I mean, are you, are, are you, um, because, you know, uh, Scotland, I was just in Glasgow uh, last December and, you know, it's, everything is really great there <laughs> um, for, for the film industry and everybody ho helps each other. And it's a really, concrete uh unified group as far as i can feel but um you know to launch these kinds of things internationally requires kind of many different understandings of many different cultures i guess is the best way to say it and i just wonder if you've ever embarked on something outside or i yeah i guess i'm yeah. um I'm interviewing to see if if I can hire you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we work for clients um, across Europe and uh, North America. Uh, and, you know, we would obviously be available for, for folk worldwide as well. Um, that doesn't say we're, you know, an expert in every country. You know, oftentimes you then work with local impact producers to, to make things happen. Or you go through a partner organization. Um, and I think one of the best examples of that actually involved uh, the D word. This is going back to 2013 to a film called I Am Breathing, where we organized a global screening day that basically resulted in this. I mean, look at look at this map. I mean, obviously a bit UK heavy because that's where the film was from. But generally speaking, um, uh, this this was a truly global thing, you know, with. Uh, you know, screenings in 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 China, in um, in in Kenya, in South America. You know, it's um, it's worth taking a look at that. It's it's it's. I think it was three hundred screenings around the world, that of which more than half of them actually happened on the Global Awareness Day for the disease um, that the film is about, motor neuron disease, which is better known in the states as ALS. And, um, you know, the, the, the reason why we have so many dots on that map was basically that we looked for, you know, ALS organizations in all of these countries and that we, you know, said to all fellow d -word members, let's do an experiment in collaborative distribution. Can you host an event wherever in the world you are? And many of these dots on this, on this beautiful map came, came about that way. So, but again, it's, a, you know, it's, it's about sort of what, what the issue is, you know, and how easy it can travel. Uh, with the oil machine, the uh, situation was that this was clearly set up as a, as a UK campaign. 
Um, oh, sorry, that's our coffee machine uh, <laughs> our coffee cleaning machine itself now. <laughs> um, sorry, where was I? I? It's that time of day. It thinks we need a <laughs> caffeine boost. <laughs> Happy hour, Ben. I was just looking for for the the events map on the on the All Machine website. Here we are. So that is um, uh, where we're at at the moment with with the All Machine. Uh, but that's simply because you know there has been very little international distribution yet. Um, it uh, uh, its international premiere was um, at at Itfa in November. Um, no, that's not quite true. Human Rights Film Festival in Berlin in October before that. Um, it'll also be at a very well-known other international documentary festival in March. So um, we're very much now focusing on how this film works internationally. It uh, obviously makes a lot of references um, to the UK and North Sea Oil. So um, we think that sort of naturally this will grow around the North Sea Basin. And part of our like new funding app, app um, application for you know phase two, if you so wish, is to kind of take this 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 internationally. That that's um, one of kind of three major points that you know you always need to kind of tell funders. Then if you go on, not just continue what you're doing, but kind of what's that new thing that you want to try, and that's that's going to be one of them. Thanks, Jane. thanks, Jane. But in terms of you know the the, the kind of um, uh, uh, the, the clients we we work with, you know, uh, or, or the also the industry events that we we speak at, there's a there's a little map here that gives you an idea of sort of where clients for campaign development or workshops or you know um, the delivery of whole impact campaigns have been based um, recently. I actually noticed I had a wonderful blog post up here that Rachel just um, <laughs> uh, finished today. <laughs> oh, sorry, you didn't actually see my screen, did you? Okay. Ah, gosh, I didn't. You didn't see my map here. Oh, gosh, I'll do that again. We haven't mentioned that's that's the map I was talking about and where our our, our clients are. Um, so you can kind of go through them and, and and get an idea. But the plug was then for the blog post which um, Rachel posted today, which is about that, that factor six that you mentioned earlier, yeah. Rachel. Six times um, more you know, people. how, you, again, six times more people came to um, uh, events that had that kind of bonus element, that after the all machine element. Uh, so I, I recommend you, you read that uh, as, a, as a little follow up to today. Um, the, yeah, that... and I, th I think another another thing we've been talking about um, lately and haven't touched on yet is also the potentials for online events and live stream events. Um, and really, uh, you know, there's sometimes we see it as a case of should we be doing theatrical or non-theatrical, but that can still mean someone is these days sitting in a very empty, um, expensive cinema by themselves all alone or sitting at home alone on their sofa. Um, and so really perhaps it's more about whether we want people to come to our film as a, that sort of soul experience or as a collective experience. And that collective experience, you know, you can create, as we said, in the theatre, um, when you can draw a crowd and have a, a reason for them to, to be there. Um, but you can also create that online. And that's something we've been trying to do with the oil machine as well. Um, those events we've had online, the screenings of the films were, um, you, you know, we were not geo blocked, so those were effectively international screenings, and we did have people come from all over the world for one or two of those um, events. Yeah, and for yeah. like the, the the first online screening, we did had like three hundred people attending, which of course is way more than we had at uh, any in person event. I think the best at an in person event was one hundred and twenty or so. Um, and that was with a very short yeah. lead time. On ben, ben, uh, uh, Rachel, when, when you do a virtual event like that, do you tend to charge a, a small amount or do you just ask for donations at the end? Or what have you found the most effective way of, of funding, crowdfunding for you know, your purposes out of those screenings? Um, that online event was a pay what you can model. And we found that actually most people paid more than um, 
the suggested amount. Yeah, I think this, the, 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 the minimum amount yeah. was uh, a pound 89, so just over two dollars. And um, people, you know, typically pay, pay, paid something like five pound, ten pound, twenty pounds, you know, um, that, that worked really well in, in that case. Um, and I've, I've seen people, you know, um, also, we, we produced a, um, a, a, the, the world premiere, which had to happen online because it was during the lockdown of the film Bank Job, right? By Dan, Dan, uh, Dan Edelstein and Hilary Powell. And uh, they had sold 2,000 tickets in advance at a price of at least 15 pounds, you know. So the pressure was on on the poor live stream producer. <laughs> but, um, you know, it showed to me that sort of, you know, depending on what situation you're in, at what point in time in, in, your, in, your, in your film's, you know, lifetime, um, but also, you know, what kind of community you've already built around it and dan's film was pretty much born out of a community so she he had these people there waiting wanting to see this and willing to you know chip in um so there's a there's a case study of that also on on our website there uh is a sort of brand new section that we've been building uh about producing online events there's only three examples on there so now we're, we're, we're kind of adding them now uh, by you know there's a here it is bank job you can read a bit more about that and, and see what that's what that's like I can also briefly show you how that looked like for the oil machine because it's also people say they do an online event and then what they do is you know they sent a video a, a Vimeo video on demand link for people to watch the film in advance and then they send a zoom link for people to talk about it and that way you lose the connection, you know, you lose that experience of watching the film together and getting to people at that moment when they're moved the most, when the credits roll. So for us, it's been instrumental to always show the film as integral part of the event. And, and, not and, and you're doing that then through um, Nation Builder? You're, you're, that's the platform you're using for the virtual screenings? Um, we, we used to initially, um, because there wasn't a suitable platform out there that would fulfill, fulfill all our criteria, we basically hacked something together um, uh, out of Nation Builder, of integrated Vimeo Live player, and a, um, a, a third party geo blocking tool. And that was called Doc Sessions. We developed that on um, behalf of the Doc Society because everybody was, you know, uh, looking for solutions at the time to post impact events online, but we're not like a tech startup. So um, when Eventif, you know, refined their methods of, of hosting events um, where, you know, the film can get played off their server, but the discussion starts immediately afterwards, um, we started using Eventif mostly, but we are generally platform agnostic. We can stream to, to, to anything mm -hmm. um, you like. Okay, we've got a bunch of questions lined up, so we're going to try and um, be as succinct as we can for the next um, 15 minutes or so. Uh, Ethan, you've been waiting patiently. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, quick question. Um, with your 100 uh, people that spoke at your different screenings, how many of them, how often did you have to pay them, and what was the range that you determined? How did you determine what to pay them? That's a very good question. Thank you. Um, we, um, most people, we, because of the nature of the topic and the film and the urgency of um, what's happening with our climate and our uh, energy supply right now in the UK, most people were willing to donate their time and speak um, for free. We tried to also find people in each um, city or town or place where the screening was happening so that we weren't paying travel and accommodation costs very occasionally we would cover that for one of the core um, members of the, the film to travel such as our film director <laughs> but um, occasionally we had a very small budget for um, speaker fees I mean like oh, 150 pounds, pounds for in person pounds. and 100 pounds for online but um, but we didn't even need to use that uh, yeah. as often as we thought we, 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 we would. 
yeah, a, a handful of people. People have right. been very, very generous um, and wanting to step in and speak. Right. Thanks. Thank you, Ethan. Uh, Thank Tyler, you. Tyler, you're up. Um, I like that you mentioned, um, I think you called oh. it random fines. Oh, I'm sorry. Was there no, something? No, it's, it's okay. Ty, Ty, you go ahead since you're speaking, but Tyler, I'll get to you uh, after Ty. Oh, um, I like that you said um, you called them random fines. Like you gave the example of putting something in a book um, in a library. Um, it, what other creative ways have you found to, to reach an audience? Um, especially nowadays when like social media is just non-existent because AI is choosing what uh, people see of yours and, you know, paying for stuff is kind of weird now as well. Like what are creative ways that you found to, to get people to notice your stuff? Um, I, I think one, one good example is um, through the route of producing additional content and creating a whole story universe around a film where that really makes sense. So one example would be the, the campaign for the film Bugs that I uh, mentioned earlier, where we built a platform that's called Bugs Feed. I'm just going to bring that up to, to illustrate. Uh, so bugs feed as in as in uh, buzzes feed, which was a thing at the time. Um, so you can see it here. Uh, that's basically a way to um, explore the world of edible insects. Why should I eat insects? How can I eat insects? And what's stopping me? And at the time when we launched this, the film wasn't as prominent as you see it there in that latest uh, iteration it was really just appearing like an in the sidebar so it was very much kind of based around this sort of central um uh, uh content and we'd found out there wasn't any kind of platform about edible insects out there on the web that was you know tackling this in a kind of more neutral and and more fun way because it was either you know food enthusiasts who you know said oh i cooked something with mealworms or it was um you know a uh, scientist or it was a pesticide company those were offering resources about edible insects uh and you know we saw that gap and you know for example we created as as part of this um a directory uh of uh, everything we could find uh you know anywhere you can get um uh you can you can get edible insects so oh, oh gosh i haven't been on this website in a while um i'm trying to find the directory here stores and restaurants exactly that's what i was looking for um and then we reached out to all these organizations that we had here compiled by type of 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 offering by country by type of insect they're offering you know so where can i get some beetles for example um, and then you see them all. And then we reached out to all these groups and said, hey, we just listed you in our directory on our website. You know, do you want to check your listing to make sure we got it right? And then, of course, they all went there to see what, where are we listed? What is this site? And why does this site exist? And then they discover the film on there without it ever ha having been like advertised in their face. So that's what I mean with a sort of random discovery in a sense. Um, it's sort of not not that sort of outbound marketing where kind of you know there's a big shout to go and watch this film but it's more like you discover it by chance and that means you take ownership of that discovery and you go like oh yeah that looks interesting I, I, let me have a closer look yeah that's that's right. um, a good good very, good very clever that. make sure we didn't screw up your name on um thanks thanks Tyler. uh tyler Hi, Ben and Rachel. Thank you for doing this today. I um, think it's a big help to documentary filmmakers. We kind of uh, work very hard and wonder at that point, okay, how does the film get out there? So thank you for what you're doing. I wanted to know, uh, is the 30, I'm a little confused about the pricing. So is the $32 a month, what do you work for? I mean, what is, what would be the, the deal uh, if, say I'm doing a film right now that we're finishing uh, editing and of course you know outreach is a, is a concern so what would we be what would the deal be with you 
I, I, we, we need to discuss that on the, on, on the basis of what you, what you need done. Uh, there, there's a range of you know, hourly and uh, daily rates um, depending on what kind of job gets done. You know, some simpler database work uh, is cheaper than you know, um, giving a presentation somewhere. Or so um, you know, uh, outreach is uh, cheaper than, than the production of a live stream because you know, there all the tech comes into play. So we have like rates for, for all of these things, uh, which we'd be happy to, to discuss with you. Um, the pricing that was mentioned earlier was a completely different thing. That was what Nation Builder, which is the company that we're not related with, we're just sort of experts in using their software, um, what Nation Builder charges their clients uh, to um, uh, on, on a monthly basis. That, that I had that another too. question, if that's okay. Sure. Just one more. Um, and what kind of you were? You, do you achieve the partnerships for the doc? I, I mean, you were talking about these strategic partnerships, which right now is something that's been mentioned to us uh, about one of our our films. What, what the question is? What kind of legal document does it take to do a partnership with a with a company or nonprofit? I mean, what what is the the? De I'm always asking, what is the business? How does it? How do you? In what is, does it entail to do that if you do have somebody interested or a company interested? Yeah. I mean, often we need a nonprofit organization. We are not one ourselves, um, just to keep things simple because running a nonprofit is a lot of work. Um, we partner with a nonprofit organization that then formally hosts the campaign if that is needed in order to access funding that's only available to nonprofits. And um, it's a it's a bit similar to kind of like what you, I think you call fiscal sponsorship in the in the states. Uh, there are um, um, lost my train of yep. Yeah, go on. <laughs> so in other words, if we are already fiscally sponsored, which we are, that part of the equation would not be necessary. Yeah, I mean, we would talk. We'd need to talk more concretely um, about sort of what what the situation is in in, in every case, of course. Um, but uh, we've we've sort of accessed funding directly. We've you know done it through partner organizations. You mentioned the uh, yeah. Your question was about the legal thing, not the legal agreement. Um, typically, we don't go to great lengths, but we make sure that something's there that's often not there. Um, which is uh, basically like a sort of memorandum of understanding that uh, gets signed by by both parties. So it, we're trying to kind of keep it simple without lawyers, just sort of, this is the expectation of what you do, this is what we do, you know. And um, oftentimes it also makes sense to define an impact license and put a price tag on that. Um, there's okay. different ways, for example, to, you know, talk about how you do you know, filmmakers or producers or other rights holders get, get paid during all this. You know, either, for example, if they actively work in the campaign and uh, contribute to that, or it could also be that, you know, the campaign pays um, often a fixed sum that would cover, you know, uh, a, maybe a predefined amount of community screenings or, or things like that. Um, what's also often important is to separate the um the film distribution elements from the campaigning elements because some um funders of of the campaigning element would otherwise ask are we not just subsidizing a film distribution here so we always are very very careful to you know draw that line and explain that's a sort of film distribution in the case of the oil machine that was supported by screen scotland a public funding body um and the campaign money came from another uh, organization completely different part to which we were able to say you're this is just for the campaign you're not subsidizing uh, a regular uh, film release here ben, ben just to follow up on tyler's first question do you ever work on a on a flat rate for the project because it's you know hard to budget for this if you're doing it sort of to, to anticipate how many hours might be involved in your kind of a la carte menu um, we don't do flat rates for entire projects, but we can agree on a maximum budget. Basically, you, with us, it's always you get what you pay for. We charge hourly or daily rates. 
and we uh, have time tracking running in the background of the, the, the computer using some accessibility features. And at the end of the day, we can go through everything that hasn't been classified automatically and say, okay, that was this project, that was this project, and these five mm -hmm. minutes there and so on. And it's, it's a bit bean counter-ish, but it's the only way for us to be, you know, fair um, to, to, to clients and also not to have the feeling ourselves that we did a lot more than we were paid for or, you know, on the client side that they paid all this money and they didn't really see what's, what's, what's coming around from that. So, so in that our clients typically get like a monthly timesheet that lists all of these activities every day so they can see exactly what was done. And that's also the only way for us to, you know, juggle multiple projects and doing, you know, 20 minutes of this and then half an hour of that. And that's, that's just how, you, how our days are here. So that's part of the initial call is you'll talk over what needs to be done or what they, you know, and you can kind of estimate what it might be, but obviously not charge that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously we 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 like to deliver on time and on budget, and if we overrun on either, then there's usually a good reason for that, and um, that can then be mutually discussed and and uh, you know either agreed or not. So it's, it's very transparent, though. Yeah, yeah. great. Um, Jimmy, you're up. Thank you. Um, yes, I do have a question. I'm not going to. Well, no, I, I have a couple of questions. I'll keep it short. Um, okay, more of a comment. First of all, thank you. This is so cool. Really, I'm super excited just hearing your success. It's amazing. I'm in England as well, so whenever I hear about filmmakers doing stuff in in uh, in England, in a, you know, old small, it's nice to hear that. Um, you made a, just a comment for for my question. The comment was. You know, you talked about how do filmmakers get paid? That's, that's a question. I think for some of us who are not independently wealthy like me that live on caviar and bathe in champagne, how filmmakers get paid is, is the question. That's like the question um, for some of us. And uh, so thank you for at least acknowledging that and, and talking about that as well. Link to that would be anything you can share on return on investment. So uh, you know, what kind of ROI should I be expecting for this to be worth my financial effort and time effort? Um, because I mean, not that you can guarantee it, but like Jimmy, yeah, typically you should be making 5% of whatever you put in, 5% should be what you should look at making or actually you have no idea and you could lose everything. Just, I mean, but that's still not my question. My question is much more simple. And when you talked about your q and I was really excited to hear about the live screenings you had and people coming and the questions. And how did you promote your Q&As that were able to get to the people so they knew there was gonna be a screening, a Q&A and show up? Did the Cinema House just do that or was it, yeah. How, how, do you, how were you able to get, get people to be aware that this was happening and then for them then show up, buy their tickets and watch the film and, and listen for the Q&A. First of all, we're in Scotland, not England. That's an important distinction for anybody living <laughs> here, but- uh, That is very true. Um, <laughs> I grew up in America, so I'm, still, I'm still learning the difference. But yes, maybe, thank you very much. Maybe you can talk about the cinemas yeah. and, 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 and the, the, the local groups. Yeah, so there's two sides uh, to it. The first group is cinemas, and of course cinemas have their own, uh, you, you would hope, their own inbuilt uh, mailing lists and promotion and publicity. Um, certainly Picture House Cinema was um, our key cinema chain in the UK and they were fantastic to work with and had a whole green screen initiative so they were pushing it out under the umbrella of, of this sort of national green screen program. Um, that was very good for, for driving interest to the cinemas and then of course speakers have their own mailing lists and you hope that you know they're going to be pushing it out on their channels and uh, encouraging people to show up for the community groups um you know community groups uh if it's um a local extinction rebellion group or transition town group or other um organization they've got their own inbuilt audience and mailing list and for many people they have regular ongoing programs. They might even have a monthly film night. 
uh, and this is uh, a social occasion for members of their organization and their mailing list and again um, you know that's been very very effective in getting the word out and bringing, bringing people to screenings and regarding your, your, your question about you know uh, ROI um, that's a tricky one because in essence in the world of impact you know you are trying to not look at you know the financial side of profit as well if even big corporations these days have triple bottom lines you know where there's the the financial bottom line but there's also the bottom line of what they've achieved for um, you know people and, and the planet and um, the um, and I think we need more of that thinking in in that film world that we have these powerful tools that can achieve these things and the primary aims of the type of work that we do are kind of to increase reach and to have impact and you know I don't necessarily need to see money back you know here there weren't even screening fees involved the the community groups got to um, screen the film for free which you know was allowed them to not charge people for coming there which you know and turn um you know, at a time of, 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 of uh, a cost of living crisis, certainly here in the UK, um, you know, was was a decisive factor. And lucky enough, the, fun the campaign had this ind independent funding that would allow us to offer the film itself for free to all these groups. So just to build on, just going back to Rachel, just to follow up on your question. Um, so because I know my demographic, I have a very specific demographic, it would mean that me partnering with cinemas that are in the communities that serve my demographic, because then likelihood they would have a list. So rather than going to say Chelsea, maybe doing my screening in Brixton, or if I'm in the US in like Detroit and Michigan, Detroit, Columbus, because I know they've got a very large upwardly mobile black community there. And chances are they'd have that list in terms of being able to reach out. Okay. And, and Ben, thank you very much for your perspective about um, why we're doing this. It's really helpful to hear that as well. Thank you. But actually we have, I, I spot in the audience, we have another impact specialist here who actually has her hand up, Glynis Ritter, um, who uh, I think our cross paths, our paths crossed when you were still a WG film in, in Malmo in Sweden and you're now at Picture Motion, so mm -hmm. working in a similar field. I am, and by the way, uh, I see the Big Boys Gone Bananas poster back there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that was, has the first <laughs> indication from, from Frederick on it. I That's felt very welcome <laughs> here. <stayed. laughs> yeah, but it's, it's, yeah. connected us up. <laughs> it's great to see you both. Um, and thank you so much for this. Um, and so I missed the first 20 minutes. So apologies if this came up and you, you briefly spoke about this in the last question. Um, but I was just curious about in general, how supportive theaters were in getting involved in these kind of events and the extra time that that would require and if they were pretty receptive or if you were very then strategic about finding the theaters that would allow for these kind of impact events. Um, I think it depends on the theater. Uh, Glynis, thanks for the question. It really depends on the theater. Some just didn't, it was too much, you know, it's just too much. They've got too much going on. And even though we said we've got these people that would like to speak, you know, we had people in certain cities that were really <clears throat> eager to come forward and speak. They said, we just don't have time in our schedule. You know, we're just going to show the film. What we have noticed then as a result is they, they didn't get the audience numbers. There's the, fa the factor six again. Simple yeah, yeah. As that, you know, yeah. simple as that. Whereas other people just, just can't believe it. We just had one, um, cinema last night and we we'd sent them a very um a very a very excellent uh, a most excellent speaker and they couldn't believe it they said you know they they haven't seen numbers like this come through the doors for for months um because of the pandemic they they kind of almost didn't know what to do with themselves the place was was full of so many people and this is for our environmental documentary so um, it's definitely making a difference and yeah, if I could, I just, I think too, if you have folks involved in it who have their own audience, that really is a beneficial like marketing tool um, to get people in seats. So hopefully theaters will start recognizing the benefit of that. Yeah, but it's yeah. it's kind of hit and miss as, as with, you know, everything you do, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes you get 
get to people who get it and sometimes you know you, you get to people who are stuck in their ways or you know don't want to take any risks or you know whatever it is goes for the community groups as well you know not not everything we touch is brilliant you know no way yeah. you know there's there's some that are you know <laughs> yeah. we, we could go on about that part for for hours now but i'm sure there's more questions I know an hour and a half is over, but I, I'd be happy to kind of stay a bit longer if you guys. Well, um, we we actually have to kind of cut it off real soon, Ben, for for uh, back end reasons here. But um, uh, Glennis, just so you know, and for everybody as a reminder, uh, we have been recording this and will be up on our you know the D Words YouTube channel, uh, hopefully within the week. So. Um, we'll let you know we put out an announcement every Monday or email to our members every Monday or Tuesday for the following Fridays face to face and we'll put if it's up we'll put a, a notice in there and a link um but Julie if you could put a link to the D words of wisdom um on our YouTube channel uh, I think we have about 13 or 14 of these sessions now up there um so uh, Ben and Rachel, first of all, thank you so much for doing this. I just have one final question to take us on, uh, home, uh, which is kind of a, a touches on what you said earlier, Ben, about um, you know a mistake that filmmakers sometimes make is coming to you too late. Um, uh, for both of you, what what are other you know, maybe the most common mistakes that you'd warn people over. It's sort of the flip side of tips. Um, you know, what are what are um, what are some things you've learned in the course of doing this that might be kind of the most helpful takeaways? Yeah. So the 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 myths that are out there are things like um, your intern can be the impact producer. That's a, a common mistake. I think you know what we do is a somewhat highly qualified job of a lot of responsibility and you know um that that needs to be done somewhat independently um then you know thinking that crowdfunding can somehow fill a black hole in your budget uh is a big uh, myth that's still out there i think um it sometimes work if, if you've already built a big following you you know know and trust you then that can work you know see the dwards crowdfunders but um in other cases uh that's a lot more tricky and you spend more time you know getting people to that crowdfunding campaign than you actually receive in in income um you know, also uh, there's sometimes the expectation that the filmmaker need to be an activist. That's a myth. Likewise, you know, filmmakers who say this whole activism site isn't for me. That's a myth as well. I think I could I, I actually have a whole talk about all these kind of misconceptions that I, I, I could go on about, um, you know, is it online you anywhere campaign with um, a you know a, your email inbox and a, and a spreadsheet of contacts is a myth you know because especially when you're working at it as a as a as a team and when things change over time that gets very very messy so that's where things like like nation builder come in that i'd be happy to talk to anyone more about um and Oh gosh! Well, any that come to your mind now? Well, while she's doing that, Ben, can you put your um, website in, in in the chat one more time? And and folks, um, before you leave, if you want to save the chat, just go to the bottom of the chat box where you'll see um, type message here. There will be three dots to the right or underneath, and just click on that, and you'll see the save chat. And it'll save somewhere to your computer. Yeah. Or device. So there's the main website which I have up here, filmcampaign.org, and if you go in delivering impact campaigns, there are a couple of uh, big campaigns and really small ones. Try to make it a mix, you know, uh, anything from a budget of uh, you know fifteen hundred uh, euros to three hundred thousand euros. I think was the the highest one, um, and lots in between. Just kind of to give you an idea of the the variety. Um, and there's also the sharing knowledge section, which, you know, will tell you where you can catch us, such as look at the face to face with the D word here. Um, there's a section about Nation Builder that uh, has also lots of examples at the at the bottom there. 
and um, there is one about live streaming. Um, the point I was making earlier, and I didn't quite get to play the example, but you can you can watch it on here as you know that these are not only kind of you know events that are get produced in one go but we also try and achieve um, high production value that then kind of matches the the look of the the film and you know that's professionally vision mixed and uh, you know so you see reactions like in a talk show you don't always just see the person talking um, if you have a little browse around that that would be would be great Terrific. Just put a couple links in the chat so people, and um, we just look forward to hearing from you. Yeah, and it's maybe also important to say that um, initial consultations, as long as they're like around the twenty-minute mark or so, are always free. Um, and then, if you want to, you know, if you need uh, more specific and deeper advice, then we can also do that for for a very small fee. You know, our aim is not to be the kind of big marketing gurus or anything like that our aim is to work with you in the long term and be affordable so we're keeping everything on the sort of rate level that you would maybe uh, pay your team members